why are you here? Why am I here? Why do we exist? What is the the purpose of our life? What are we supposed to be doing with our lives? Are we just supposed to get a good job and and have a nice house and and put together a comfortable retirement? Are we just supposed to to find a, a good spouse and have some nice kids that get good jobs and have nice houses and put together comfortable retirements? Are we here so that we can discover how to become wealthy or increase our wealth? Are we here to to increase and become a a great athlete or or have celebrity status or or even have some type of of world leadership skills to become a, a leader in the world? There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but but if we had all of those things, do those things still give us meaning and purpose? Think of it this way. Take all of those things and then put them in the equation of your death. When you die, what what will happen with all of those things? Your family will have to go on in life without you. Your money and your possessions will be given to your family or given away or, or sold. That nice house might be torn down, make room for another Dollar General, you know, because we don't have enough, you know, anywhere. Your athletic abilities, your world leadership skills, your celebrity status, anything that you have, those things will not be used anymore by you on this earth. And and regardless of where you think you're going to go when you die, they probably won't even be acknowledged there. Now somebody say, man, I'm glad I turned up for church today. (laughs) Glad we tuned in. Boy, this is happy. But, but, But don't miss the picture here. There has to be more. There there has to be more. There has to be more than just living and dying. There has to be more than just sports and, and jobs and nice houses and nice families. There has to be more, and we know it. Like inside the deepest part of who we are, we know there has to be more. We finish up our series Together for Good today where we've been looking at at the values of a healthy local church. And why have we been doing that? Well, we've been doing that because the world is full of bad and we want to be a church that's together for good. What kind of good? Our message today is together for something great. And we're going to be looking in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, uh, Philippians chapter 1. And what we're going to find in these few verses and these few sentences from Paul today is we're going to find the kind of good that we want to be together for. The kind of good that helps us discover the purpose in life that gives us more purpose in life. And what is that good and what is that purpose? Well, let's find out. Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 21, Paul writes this, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Why are you here? Why do you exist? What is the purpose of your life? Well, Paul takes all of those questions, and he answers it like this, I'm here for Jesus Christ. I exist for Jesus Christ. My purpose is to live for Jesus Christ. Living is Christ. Life is Christ. That was the motto of of Paul's soul. And it wasn't just something that he wrote on the the letterhead that he sent out to people. It wasn't just something that he hashtagged on his Instagram reels. This was who Paul was. Living for Christ. Life in Christ. It's been said that that Paul had the equivalent of a a couple of PhDs in in our day. He was an accomplished man. He was a a leader. He was well-respected. But he had discovered in his life, and particularly through his conversion, through his salvation, that physically and spiritually and mentally and emotionally and every other Lee in, in life, he had discovered that the one thing that gives the most meaning and purpose, the one thing that helps us answer that real rational question of our existence is knowing and following Jesus. 
He had discovered and seen a lot of other things, but he found no purpose like the purpose he found in following Jesus. He knew that the greatest life you could live with the most meaning and the most purpose was spent knowing and following Jesus. So, is that how you are spending your life? Maybe you're not a Christian. You, you know you're not a Christian. Or maybe you profess to be a Christian, but, but your heart has never truly been changed. Like your, your heart would honestly say you're, you're not really knowing and following Jesus. If so, we would plead with you to come to Christ, to repent of your sin, to discover that true, lasting purpose and meaning can only be found in Jesus. In fact, if you keep looking for purpose and meaning and anything else, you will keep hitting a dead end. You'll keep chasing after meaning and purpose and everything you can possibly imagine in this world, but your heart was created to glorify and worship and enjoy God forever, and the only way you can do that is through salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus brings meaning. Jesus brings joy. Jesus brings purpose, and not just today, but purpose and joy and meaning forever. It, it's the nature of who he is. The only way to escape chasing after everything else in the world, looking for meaning and purpose, is to turn to the person of Jesus. Because he was and is perfect, he was the only one who could satisfy the penalty of sin. To satisfy the penalty of, of my sin and your sin. Jesus is the only one, and he did that by voluntarily sacrificing himself on a cross outside of Jerusalem. And it is his sacrifice, it is his work on the cross, it is his resurrection, it is his promised return that can bring meaning and purpose to every single millisecond of your life. In fact, the meaning and the purpose and joy that your heart longs for the most in this life and in the life to come can only be found in knowing and following Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I've, I've searched the whole world over. I've looked at all the other ways, but I have found nothing that gives me meaning and purpose that helps me understand the question of why I'm here and my existence outside of the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul is writing this while he's incarcerated. He's, he's in prison, maybe some type of, of house arrest, but he's incarcerated because he was preaching the gospel. He was calling people to faith in Jesus. And so he's in some kind of prison. And at any moment, Paul knows that the guard could knock on the door and say, sorry, man, your time's up. The judge has handed down the sentence and you're to be executed at noon tomorrow. And so in the middle of that time, Paul is, is writing. <laughs> and it might be helpful for us to catch a drift of, of what he's writing, to live as Christ and to die as gain. In other words, as we face changing religious freedoms and, and unknown change in religious freedoms in our country, it might be helpful for us to see that Paul, as he's incarcerated, was thinking about me and you. Paul wasn't thinking about his religious freedom. He was actually thinking, I sure hope the gospel gets to Dow in North Augusta, South Carolina. I hope the gospel crosses the ocean and gets to every square inch of this planet and maybe even beyond this planet because he had discovered that meaning and purpose was found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So his religious freedom was not his priority. Your salvation was his priority. That might be helpful for us to remember as we walk through these unknown days. That it is the power and the authority of the gospel that should always be our primary concern. As Paul wrote this letter, he knew his physical life could be taken away from him at any moment, but it was not a primary concern. Because Paul knew that in that moment he was spiritually alive in Christ. So whatever happened to him physically was not a priority. How, how in the world 
could he come to even think like that? Here's why. Because he didn't just have a profession of faith. Paul was not banking his life on on a prayer that he prayed with the preacher or or sinner's prayer. He prayed at camp or, or baptism or even a card in the church office that said he was a member. He was not banking his life and his heart and his mind and his soul on a profession of faith. He was banking his heart and mind and soul on a possession of faith. He truly possessed salvation in Jesus Christ. He possessed salvation in the one true Messiah, the one true Savior. And through the birth and life and death and resurrection, ascension and promised return of Jesus, Paul discovered that no matter what happened in his life, without a doubt, the moment he breathed his last, he would be alive forever. That's not a fairy tale. It's it's not a religious legend. The birth and life and death, the the resurrection, the ascension, the promised return of Jesus brings all of these things to a reality. Paul knew that he would be alive when he died, and that gave him great joy even in prison. Are you looking for meaning and purpose in life, or are you trying to find an answer for that question of your existence why why am i here well paul's telling us you need to look no further than his simple creed to live is christ and to die is gain that's where you will find meaning that's where you will find purpose the phrase that we use often around here goes like this only one life it will soon be passed only what's done for christ will last Paul is is soaking up an understanding that he had life in Jesus, and if he died, he would have more life in Jesus. And in the middle of understanding that he had life in Christ and he had life in Christ in death, all of this also kind of throws his mind in a bit of dilemma. He he starts kind of having a conversation with himself, and we're going to listen in on that conversation. Look in verse 22. Paul says, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Paul says, hey man, dying is is gain. And then then he pauses, he's like, well, but if if I don't die, if if I'm not executed, if if I'm able to keep living, I can keep living for Christ and I can keep pointing people to Jesus. If he were alive, he could keep helping people get right with God before it's too late. Just a curiosity question. Is, is that how we think as modern Christians? Lord, I want to stay alive a little longer so that I can help people find Jesus. Now look, if we're, if we're honest, and let's just be honest, if we're honest, we usually want to stay alive a little longer because we're wanting to enjoy things in life, right? We're wanting to, to spend more time with our family. We're wanting to, to make more money. We're wanting to travel. We're wanting to relax, And none of those things are evil. They're not. It's just we won't really find any of those things in the gospel. We won't find any of those things in the call of Jesus to follow after him. So so they're not evil. It's just they're not primary. It's not how we should be primarily thinking. And Paul wasn't primarily thinking that way. Paul's like, man, you know, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I I die, I gain more of Christ. But if if I stay alive... I might be able to help people gain Christ for the first time. He keeps thinking to himself in verse 22, and I do not know which to choose. Does Paul have some kind of sovereign power over his life? Some kind of sovereign power over what the, the, the judge is going to hand down as a sentence? Some kind of sovereign power over, over the destiny of his life? Nope. Paul had no sovereign power over the court system. He had no sovereign power over the moment that he was going to die. The only sovereign power that exists in the universe is God's and God's alone. Only God has ultimate sovereign power over life and death and every other option and choice in life. Only God. But Paul is looking at both of these options and he's like, you know what? I'm struggling here because both seem attractive. To die and be with Christ seems really attractive. 
to live and keep helping people find Jesus, well, that seems really attractive. It's, it's a win-win, and he's struggling. Should he prefer to live, or should he prefer to die? He keeps thinking, verse 23, but I am hard-pressed from both directions. I mean, he's torn. This, this is not a, it's not a casual thing. He's like, man, I, I really don't know which is better. Life and death, they both sound good. Why? Why in the world would life and death both sound good? Because Paul is clearly saying, whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead, I have Jesus. And Jesus was the common denominator of his peace, of his joy, of his happiness, of his satisfaction. So, question for us. What is the common denominator of our peace and our joy and our happiness and our satisfaction? What is it that can't be rattled in our life no matter what? Is the, is the common denominator enough money in the bank? Or having the house paid off? Or job security? Or maybe a a good movie or a good steak or a a good round of golf or a great day of shopping? Is it maybe a a new outfit or or a healthy marriage or or a healthy family? You know, I've I've had to spend a lot of time um, just trying to coordinate some things, you know, at my parents' house. And, and, you know, it's a a humbling reality as as I sit and and, and grieve with, with hope that my dad is, is no longer with us, but I'm, I'm also just looking at all of these things that they're nice, they're good, but you know, they, they're losing a lot of their value. It, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. Is the common denominator of your hope stuff? Things of, of this world. All those things can be gone in a blink. We know that. We, we kind of believe it, but we don't really live like that. This is what Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 7. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. I mean, you know, Louis Grizzard used to say there's a difference between the word naked and naked. You know, naked is you don't have any clothes on. Naked is you don't have any clothes on and, and something's up, you know. We came into this world naked. We came with nothing. You know what? We also came into this world, I'm thinking maybe all of us, crying. Ain't nobody had to teach us how to throw a temper tantrum, all right? We came into this world with nothing, and no matter how hard we try to deny it, we will go out of this world with nothing. And if we're not careful, we'll make that depressing. It's not depressing. Because if the common denominator of your hope is stuff, that is really depressing. But if the common denominator of your hope is Jesus, that is the opposite of depressing. That is full of joy, full of peace, full of satisfaction. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I've tried it all. tried the stuff. I've tried the people. I've tried the, the accolades, the education owning stuff. I've tried all of it, but what I've discovered is to live as Christ and to die as gain. If I have Christ, I have everything that I will ever need, period, exclamation point. Paul keeps thinking, verse 23, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. (laughs) I mean, sounds like a crazy man, right? To be released from earthly life and be with Christ is better than staying on earth and being alive. It it sounds crazy. It does. It sounds crazy. But that's exactly what he's saying. To be released from earthly life and to be with Christ is better than staying on earth and being alive. If you're a Christian, do you really believe that? I mean, like, really, really, really. Do you really believe that dying is gain? If so, then it has to impact our home and our marriages and our parenting 
It has to impact what happens in, in every corner of our life. It has to impact wh- how we respond to that news from the doctor. If we really believe that dying is gain, it impacts every part of how we do earthly life. Now look, I, I confess, I have moments when dying doesn't feel like gain, you know? I mean, there's, there's some things I'm wanting to do, you know? I'm, I'm wanting to be a better husband. I'm wanting to be a, a better father. I'm wanting to be a, a better son and a you know, better brother, better uncle. I'm wanting to be a better pastor and a better shepherd. I want to be better at catching up with my friends. I, I do want to travel some, you know, I do. I'm, I want to go to some restaurants all over the world and just eat, you know. I mean, that just, that sounds phenomenal, you know. I, I want to rent a, a cabin in Maine for a month and write a book, you know. Uh, I, I would like to order the best bacon from every state and have it shipped to my house, you know. I mean, there's some things I want to do that, you know, dying doesn't feel like gain. But we have to be careful. It's not that any of those things are evil, but we have to be careful. Because as followers of Jesus, we have to be careful that we don't get dominated by the things of this world as our definition of gain. Our ultimate definition of gain has to be Jesus. Because he's the only one that brings peace and satisfaction in life and after life. We need to embrace the words of the psalmist from 3,000 years ago when he sang this, For a day in your courtyards, Lord, is better than a thousand elsewhere. Paul knew that verse. But Paul knew, he, he understood that the courtyards of God were the best place he could possibly be. He knew that. He wanted to be there, but he's wrestling. He's, he's wrestling with this dilemma in his heart and mind. Well, should I go or, or should I stay? Which, which one's better? Verse 24, he keeps thinking, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. <laughs> as Paul sits in prison, as he awaits sentencing for, for death, as he is trying to figure out in his mind whether he wants to be alive or dead, which one's better, to, to stay alive or, or to leave and be with Jesus, his thoughts are wrapped up with you in mind, with me in mind. His thoughts are wrapped up with the salvation and sanctification and satisfaction of other people. That's how he's thinking. How often do we think like that? How often as Christians do we really think, you know what, God, I, I don't want my way here. God, I, I, want, I want what's ever best for my spouse. I want what's ever best for my husband, whatever's best for my wife. I, I want what's ever's best for my parents. I want whatever's best for, for my brother. I want what's ever best for, for my sister. I want whatever's best at, at, at work. I want whatever's best for the company, whatever's best for the country, whatever's best for the church how often do we really think that way i mean i think we we think we think that way Mm, in the nitty-gritty of real life how often do we really think god i i want to think of others and i want my life to exist for others paul had the riches of heaven in his sight and he said "Mm, I'll, i'll wait if i can help some people find the riches of Christ. I'll wait. I'll I'll hang on for a little bit. You know what this is? You know what this gives Paul? It gives him cred. Credibility. Because imagine that we were sitting there that day and we're listening to this letter being read. Imagine this letter is being read to us and and we're hearing this guy that that we kind of know, we met maybe when he came through on his missionary journey or maybe we've never met and we're hearing him write to us, you know what, I want to do everything I can to make sure that you keep following Jesus and if it means I forego the riches of heaven, I'll I'll do that for for a season, whatever that looks like. That's the kind of credibility that, that when we hear someone willing to sacrifice what their heart desires the most so that we can find what our heart desires the most, we should listen to that person. (laughs) We should listen to what they teach and what they say. We we should pay attention. 
Paul is truly living out his faith in Jesus Christ in the middle of his dilemma. And then he finally says this in verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Paul had one of the magic eight balls. He shook it up and found out when when things were going to happen. Nope. He didn't have some magical way. He didn't have a scoop from the guard at the door about what was going to happen with his sentencing. He didn't have some great vision from God. None of that was going on. He simply had a passion to stay and help people find Jesus. And he's hoping and praying that God would match his passion, that God would say, yep, that's that's what we're going to do. And why did he really want to remain? Listen to the last thing he says in verse 25. For your progress and joy... In the faith. Paul wanted to forego the blessings of heaven so that he could be a part of people like me and you coming to faith in Jesus Christ and growing in our faith. And not just in our faith, but in our joy. He wanted us to grow in our joy. Death was gain. No confusion on that. But Paul living would allow him the opportunity to help us find joy. Joy in him. Joy in saying, oh, man, we just love Preacher Paul. Man, we're going to start following Preacher Paul wherever he goes. Man, we're, we're going to be online and follow all his posts. Preacher Paul, Preacher Paul. Nope, that, that, that's not the joy he was looking for. He was going to help them find joy and purpose and meaning and a rational reason for the question of why do I exist? Why am I here? And all of it was going to be wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. All of it was going to be wrapped up in knowing and following Jesus. We can search the whole world over. But this intelligent, practical, hardworking, accomplished man says, you can keep looking, and you can keep looking, but you're not going to find what you're looking for the most. We spent the last few months on this journey that we're calling Together for Good. It's, it's not the end of the journey. We're, we're launching it a little more. I had somebody say, hey, man, you should preach all these again. Maybe I will. I don't know. But, but what we're launching it for, and so just I want you to, to hear again these values that we've been unpacking. And if you haven't listened to these messages, you can go on Amazon Music, you can go on YouTube, you can go on our church website uh, and listen to some of these if, if you missed one. But, but listen to them again. Together for good, we want to be together for God's sovereignty, together for absolute truth, together for confident prayer, together for making disciples, together for joyful nations, together for maximum relationships, together for genuine conversions. We want to be together for meaningful membership, for generous giving, for committed fellowship, for truth-filled homes, for servant leadership, for musical worship, and for expanding churches. Those, all those values we're going to pursue as a church but I want you to pick one or two of them. You'll see these. We're, we're going to keep these in front of you in the months ahead. Find one or two and let those one or two be where you put your focus and your energy. Pick two of them and, and just let your focus and your energy say, all right, look, we're, we're going to do all these things as a church, but I'm going to pick two of these and I, I'm going to try to run with them. And why? Why should you do that? Here's why. Because running with them will help you find meaning and purpose and answers for why you exist. Because these things are all connected and wrapped up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tammy, our family life minister, sent me an article this week. And the article was titled this, The Best Use of Your Short Life. The Best Use of Your Short Life. And it's an article uh, by a guy named John Ensor. I hope I'm saying his last name right. And it's about his mother-in-law. Um, and I, 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 know, I don't know if it's Johnny or, or Joni. I'm going to go with Joni because it's spelled either way. So I'm going to go with Joni. But it's about his mother-in-law, Joni, who just happens to be 100 years old. <laughs> Do the math. He's writing an article about his 100-year-old mother-in-law who's 100 years old. And the title of the article is Your Short Life. Short life, 100 years, it's a blink. We don't believe that, but it's a blink. This is how John described Joni. 
She's in relatively good health for being 100 years old. She laughs, she cries, she jokes a bit. Last week, she casually told me she had just completed a month-long study of the book of Daniel. Yet she struggles with one particular question. It haunts her, especially on days when her outlook is low or her blood pressure is high. And what's that question? Well, we began with this question. Hey, why am I here? Joni's question is, why am I still here? Why am I still here? This is how John answers the question. Because living for Christ at 100 is itself a great thing that glorifies God and advances his kingdom. And finishing a study on the book of Daniel at 100 years old is an attractive picture of what it means to seek the kingdom of God and long for the day of Christ appearing, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Then John goes on and says this, while she cannot travel these days, her testimony can. I've told her stories in China, Uganda, Cuba, and elsewhere. She needs a walker, but her story can still run. That's good. I sometimes feel she is living just so long as she is needed to woo the next generation to live for Christ. That is something great to work for. Our 14 values as a church and, and our, our slogan, so to speak, of being together for good, it's, it's not just a catchy slogan. We're not just trying to throw together a t-shirt or, or put together a sermon series. We are together for something great. We're, we're together for something great. When we're together for good, we're together for the gospel. And being together for the gospel is being together for something great. Because the gospel is the full, final exclamation point of all of history. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a legend. It's, it's the hope of eternity all found in Jesus Christ. Why are you here? Why am I here? Why do we exist? What is the, the purpose for our lives? Look, I, I can't tell you exactly what job to take. I can't tell you exactly who you need to marry. I can't tell you exactly which house you should buy or, or how you should spend your money. But I can tell you this. If your heart can discover the reality of what it means to live for Christ and to die as gain, if you can get that, then you will find the meaning, you will find the purpose and you will know why you exist. And dear friend, you will not live in vain. To live is Christ. To die is gain. That is good. Let's be together.